All right, gang. All right, welcome back to uh, part three, I guess. We're going to cover, start with facing and refusal. Try to cover that. I got one counter on the map there, and I got my handy dandy box of info counters when I play. Um, by the way, I just ordered like 10 more of these things, 32 compartments, and I ordered 10 more 21 compartments. The 21 compartment ones are like a hard plastic. I got them from Joanne's Fabrics for like six bucks. And the, the hard plastic ones fit inside these one and a half inch boxes, which a lot of the MMP games and um, some of the boxes for a GMT, I think, are like two inches and stuff. And, you know, sometimes you get a lot of stuff in there. But those boxes fit in there perfect and they lock. And then I put all my series games informational counters in these big 32 inch ones. So I got a bunch of these should be here within the next week. Great. They're a great deal. You can usually you can get them at Walmart, but my Walmart decided to uh, rearrange the store. So the section they decided to tear down while they build a new one was the crafts area, which is where these are. So I had, I had to order some online, but I'm glad I did because I got them cheaper. All right. So let's talk about, we're going to talk section of seven facing and refusal. All right, you have two directions you can face in this game, all right? You must be, for all forms, except for one, you must be facing a vertex, okay? Uh, so when you're in advance, when you're in tack, when you're in open, or when you're in, well, of those three, you must be facing a hex side, uh, a hex vertex. When you're in march order, like on this road, which now you probably can't see it, yeah, just barely, you're facing a hex side because you're where the road's going. You're following that, okay, or wherever your path of travel is, okay. But for all other formations, you are facing a vertex, okay. Keep that in mind. Now I will say this: that there's a designer's note right under section seven point one that says that, well, they talk about that all units in a hex must be facing the same way, okay? So if a unit moves into a hex where another unit is, that unit moving in has got to assume the same facing of the unit that's already there. And the little designer note says that is to help manage the counters on the game. It's not historical. You don't have to play by that. You can have, you could have two different units in there facing different directions but you see how much of a pain that would be and one little bump and you maybe you move one and you're like well which way was he facing so it's better just to have them all facing the same way okay um well, like i said you don't have to you can change that okay so in facing you have three <sighs> you've got three zones all right the, the two hexes in the front are your frontal hexes, okay? The hexes directly to the side are your flank, all right? And the hexes to your back end are rear. So both of those are rear, those two are flank, and these two are frontal or front, okay? That's important because if you get shot coming in from this hex side, you're getting shot in the flank. If you get shot from here, you're getting shot in the rear. Now, it will say in the rules that shooting, so a unit sitting here so let's say this union, let's use this cannon right here. Let's say this cannon right here was sitting, eh, we gotta get him somewhere right, sitting right here. And he's shooting into him. If he's shooting down the hex side that touches the frontal, down the vertex, it's not flanking fire, all right? So shooting through here is not frontal fire or flank fire, or through here is not flank fire. This shooting straight down the hex row at him into his flank is flank fire, all right? And then shooting into his back end is rear fire, shooting straight up the hex right there, okay? So keep that in mind. Frontal, flank, rear, and shooting into the front of a person right here down the hex side that touches the frontal hex is considered still considered frontal fire. It's not flanking fire, okay? Now, you can only move and fire and shot combat out of your front hexes, all right? You can't do it out of your rear hexes, all right? Facing. You can change facing. Now, I was looking at the rule, and I've always had a question, oh my God, if I just wanted to turn around and run away, 
it's not like it's going to take me any effort to just do an about face and take off running. All right. And I, I, I can't seem to find it anyhow. So you are allowed to change vertexes. You're facing one vertex for free in the hex you're in without moving. And when you're moving, so we're going to go back down here. Let's say he's move, he's here and he's moving. He can move to that hex. And let's say he wants to, he wants to go to this hex. Well, as you're moving, you can change vertex, one vertex without any movement point cost. Okay. And if you're sitting still and you just want to change facing to one vertex, it doesn't cost you anything, but any other vertex after that, it charged you cost one movement point. Okay. Now I'm trying to validate this, but to turn around 180 degrees, I mean, you're literally just spinning around. And I can't see where there's any cost for that. As a matter of fact, I'm looking in here at the, um, uh, let's see. In addition to units under attack orders because of their very linear state, adhere to the following. One stacked and changing facing 180 degrees, invert the stacking order for all. But see, it doesn't talk about any, any uh, change of movement. So I, I, I'm going to have to assume that, and I'm going to have to dig a little deeper on this one because I still haven't seen it, that just turning all the way around costs you one movement point. All right, now here's the thing. Let's say these two units are in this hex, stacked, okay? And by this configuration, the top unit, imagine they're like in two lines, okay? So the top unit is the front one, all right? This, this is the way you got to kind of look at this. If he wants to move backwards out of the hex, he's got to move through that unit, all right? So remember your rules when you get to movement about moving through a friendly unit, okay? If this guy wants to move out of the back of the hex, it's no problem because he's, he's in the, he's, he's considered behind him anyhow. So imagine they're both in that hex like this. All right. So if this guy wants to move out backwards, he's the bottom unit. It, there's no cost for him. He's not moving through a unit, but if he wants to move forward, he's got to move through the front unit. So you gotta, you, you gotta, he's gotta pass through him. So keep that in mind. Um, if you are, if this unit's sitting here, and this guy's back here behind him, and he moves into that hex. Let me get on this side of it. If he moves into that hex, one, two, he goes underneath as the bottom unit. All right? So if you move into a unit from behind it, you, be, you go underneath him. And that's important because of, of your firepower coming out of it, especially with artillery, because artillery has to be on top to fire, so... Um, there are certain rules where a unit can move in. I, I want to say it's with the artillery. If an infantry or cavalry unit moves in, you can put them on top, right? Um, all that preserving the artillery, okay? So, and if you, like I say, if you move in from the front to a unit, you become the top unit, all right? And remember, always maintain the same facing, all right? That's the basics of that. Let's see. Uh, when changing to or from March orders, you adjust the facing at the time the new order take, takes effect, uh, either during the division orders, move phase, or the change orders. And this doesn't cost, these are these are circumstances where you don't have to pay any movement points. Uh, for changing facing during road or trail movement, uh, you don't have to pay advance after combat, you can change your facing, it doesn't cost you anything. As a reaction to enemy movement or fire, you can change your facing and it doesn't cost anything. You can always change one vertex to fire, and that's covered in a certain rule, uh, fire combat we'll get into later. And then after you rally. So if this guy was disrupted or just, uh, here we go, I'm going to get chewed out for this one. If he was disrupted or whatever the stinking D is, all right, and he gets rallied, you can change his facing right after you rally, all right? Pretty simple. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, any phasing unit that starts his movement in an enemy frontal hex, he may change facing by only one vertex in that hex. So if he, if, let's get one of these out of here. All right, if he is sitting here and he's in this frontal hex of this enemy, all he can do, you know, as far as within that hex is he could change facing one hex, one vertex, all right? 
and I have had circumstances where I needed to get fire. I needed to mask some fire on a, a particular unit, and I needed to change the facing of one to do that. So in the frontal hex, uh, the front, and you got to be specific about that. We know that this is frontal going this way, but these are the two frontal hexes. Always keep that in mind, okay? And y you'll hit rules where that makes sense to you. Um, units suffering certain combat results or rallying from such results have the following abilities and restrictions concerning changing facing. Retreat. Unit maintains its original facing, no change allowed. So that means that if you decide to retreat this guy, so he's going to shock him, and you want to retreat before shock, and you retreat him, he cannot change his facing. So if he's retreating two hexes, he can go through his rear hexes. So he could go one, two, or he could go one, two, or he could go one, two, or he could go one, two. But you can't change your facing, all right? Um, now, from what I understand, I had to get a clarification on this. I had a case where I couldn't retreat this direction. I needed The only place I could go was sideways. Well, from what I'm told, you can do that. But you still have to maintain your facing, all right? So if you had to retreat over here, or let's say you had to retreat two hexes and you were going to go here. So you could, the only thing you could do was go, duh, duh. Well, you do it and you, you maintain your facing, all right? Not sure. I, I'm sorry, but if I'm being retreated, somebody's charging me. I'm going to run away, and I'm all, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to freaking run. It only takes me a split second to turn back around. But that's not how the rule states. You must maintain your facing. So I guess in a way that simulates that when you back up. So, but it doesn't matter whichever way you retreat, you have to maintain your facing. So if he's facing that way, and you no matter where you retreat, he's got to continue to face that way. Right, um, I know that applies to like getting a shot at as you run away. Uh, rally. A rallied unit may change facing one vertex upon being rallied. Okay, so like I said, this guy was disrupted, dispersed. All right, we're gonna call it little deed from now on. He was little deed. You rally him, so you flip him over, and then you can turn him one vertex. All right, and, uh, you can flip him one vertex after he rallies, and it doesn't cost anything. All right. Pretty simple. These are the, most of these rules like this are pretty simple. Uh, let's see, an extended column may become an extended line when the unit's orders change from march to advance or march to attack, as long as the requirements for extended line are met. Vice versa also is true. There is no cost for changing facing in either case. So if you're moving along the road in march orders. Can you see that one? Yeah. And he's in an extent. We'll put him up on things over there. Uh, he's moving along. And then you change to uh, to attack. Oh, but he's let's use a bigger counter. Say this eight here. Put him up here. Since he's eight, he's got to be an extended column. We're gonna talk about stacking in a minute. All right, so and then you come out, you know, you come out of your march orders. And you decide this guy's going to go to extended line, so you change his facing, okay? And let's see. As long as the requirements for extended line are met, he could go into an extended line formation. All right? Remember, they face the same way. You, and we're going to talk about refusal here, so you'll understand that in just a second, too. Right, we need a bigger, bigger unit here. Put him back on here. And we'll swim. We'll start this way. All right. So let's go on to refused planks. All right. A unit may refuse if it is either at the end of a line or in the center of a line with a friendly unit in one flank hex and another friendly unit in the opposite rear hex. So let's put, first of all, let's talk about what refusal is. Refusal is the turning of one of your lines. So right now, this guy can only shoot in these two hexes. Okay. But there's enemies over here, and he's at the end of the line. He's the 20th main on Little Round Top, on the back end of Little Round Top. And you want him, you can't, you don't have any more troops to get over, so you need him to cover the right side too. So what you do, what it do is called refusing your flank, and you have rights and lefts. So now his frontal hexes are like this. He's got all three of these covered. All right. So he can fire one, two, three. The di difference is, is when they're refused like that, you take the strength. And you pretty much got to divide it three ways. So an eight would probably be what three, three, two, and you never, you always put the minimum, the, the lowest number on the flank on the refused flank side. So that is just that's just taking your line, 
and refusing it or taking your line and refusing it that way. That's what that is. And, and I, I, I've used it. I used it quite a few times, especially when you're near the end of the line, um, like on the end of the first day when early sweeps down onto the right side of the 11th Corps, I had to refuse some regiments at the end of that brigade. All right, so you cannot do it. So that guy in the middle right there, he cannot refuse his flank if there's units on either side, friendly units on either side of him, okay, on either flank side. However, if this unit were down here like this in his opposite flank, he could refuse the line. So now he's shooting this way too, all right? Yes to this, no to this, all right? And he cannot refuse his flank to the right if there's a unit to his right. And he cannot refuse it to the left if there's a unit to the left, all right? So you have refused left. He can't do that because there's a unit there, all right? That's refusal. All right, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Only units under attack or advance orders may refuse. It costs one movement point. All right, units that are stacked with the refused unit must spend an additional movement point to enter the hex. Our units going to stack with it, so they got to, it costs them an additional movement point just to get in that hex because they got to rearrange themselves. A unit or stack may not refuse in both directions, so you can't have you can't have a left and a right. All right, so he can't be refused to the right and refused to the left, forming an apex at the same time. Although I'm sure it was done. Uh, I want to say Culpepper, Spot or Spotsylvania. It may have been done there. Um, a unit cannot refuse if it starts adjacent to an enemy unit. All right. So if that guy here, he was next to an enemy, he can't refuse. Even though he's got the speed, he's not allowed to refuse. Okay. So remember that one. All right. Uh, let's see. A unit may not refuse if it is in between two friendly. Well, we already talked about that. And a unit may not refuse when stacking with a unit that is not refused. Unless the stationary unit ex exits the hex during the same activation. Okay, so if they're stacked, there can be no refusing. Okay? Unless one of them leaves the hex, then in the same activation, he, he can be refused. Okay? If he's already, if he moves in here, all right? Nobody is going to. If he moves in and he, he's done, he can't do anything else, and he doesn't have a movement point to refuse, and they're both in there together, you can't just, just you two units in there, you cannot refuse. Don't refuse your flanks. You just can't do it. That's probably the simplest way to do this. All right. All right, we're going to talk about stacking. I need to get, let me get... We'll leave him there. Let me get a cavalry unit. I need to dig up a cavalry unit. Sure, I've got one somewhere. We'll put artillery on here. Let's see. Cav, 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 cav unity. All right. All right, stacking is very, very important. So, you have limits, just pretty much like any other game. Some games say you can stack two units. Uh, games like this, it's uh, strength points. Um, this one has a little bit more flavor to it. Get rid of these here. So, you have stacking limits that apply... Stacking limits apply at all times during the turn, except during movement. All right, retreats are not considered movement. There are no stacking limits for leaders or informational markers. Okay. So the only time the stacking does not apply is during movement. But at the end of it, it does. Okay. Um, stacking limits depend on the orders that are applicable to the units. It may also vary according to the scale of the battle. That that will be covered in each individual game book. All right, so infantry. Infantry in march orders. Let's get these out of the way. All right. So this guy is on this road over here, and he's in march orders. All right. 
We'll put a march order. There's well, the whole brigade's in march orders over here, right? But he's in march order. So he is an eight, okay? You can only have seven strength points of infantry or dismounted cavalry, okay? Uh, you can stack up to seven, I'm sorry. Um, as long as they are all from the same brigade, all right? If an individual unit contains more than seven strength points, you must use an extended column. So he's eight. So he's going to have 350 men. That's seven because it's 50 per uh, strength point. So he's going to have 350 men up in that piece of the road. And the other 50 are going to be trailing right behind. All right. Seven strength points when in march order of dismounted cavalry or infantry. Okay. Cavalry. Mounted cavalry. All right. He is in march mode right there. Can we see him? Let's move this over just a bit. All right. So cavalry mounted can have four strength points. Up to four strength points. Yeah, so that means you could have, you, let's say you have two units that are from the same brigade here, and they're both strength points of two. They could both be in there. Okay, in march order. Now let's say this guy was a five or a six or a seven. Well, he would have to have that marker back here. All right. All right, now, I don't have a unit handy, but we're going to cover one more. Let's say that this unit here, he was a 15 strength point, okay? You could only have seven. Well, so seven, and then seven more, and extend is 14. You still got one more point to cover, so guess what? You spread him out a third hex. So now, he, if he was a 15 strength point unit, he'd be spread out over three hexes in column. And that makes sense. It wasn't originally like that. That's been added in over the years. And, and that makes sense because 15, 750 men on that little piece of, what, 100-yard piece of road right there, probably in column, maybe three or four abreast, that, that probably wasn't going to happen. They have to be standing on each other's shoulders. Artillery. All right, so two batteries regardless of the number of guns or... 12 guns from any number of batteries may occupy a hex. Artillery may not stack with other units. Now, this is in march order. Okay, so. Remember when artillery can be with mar in march order. Remember, artillery is always in advance order. But when they're moving with the brigade, they and the brigade is in march order, then that artillery piece is in march order. All other circumstances, the artillery moves and does everything as if they were in advance order. So you could have this artillery piece in march order and he could have he could have 12 total strength points in there, right? Um, or you could have two complete so if this one unit here, let's say there's he has two more units that make up his battery, and then there's another battery with four units, uh four 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 counters that make up the battery, you could have both of those batteries stacked in that one hex in march order, okay? Or 12 guns from any number of batteries. So, not that you'll see that, but let's say you had two batteries, and between the two batteries, they had 20 strength points between them. Well, guess what? They could all be in that hex in March order. That's one big stack. Um, if they're from different organizations, so you could have this battery, you could have two of his guns in there, you could have another battery with six, and then you could have another battery with uh, four more. So you have three different batteries that, that amount to 12 guns. And that's and like I said, they cannot stack with other units when artillery is in march order because you figure you got what four, six, or eight horse teams pulling a, a gun in a carriage. That's gonna, they're going to take up a lot of space. I'm not even sure about how the, the twelve gun one works. That almost doesn't make sense. All right. No intermingling of units when in march order. Artillery may not stack with infantry, etc. Cavalry may not stack with infantry. All right. Dismounted infantry and dismounted cavalry, they're one and the same. All right, advance or attack orders. All right, let's get out of that. Let's say that this guy here, okay, on the map like that, he is in advance orders, all right? So, in advance orders, you may stack any units from the same brigade up to a maximum of 15 strength points per hex, all right? Or any one unit, regardless of strength, plus one battery, or six guns 
from any number of batteries, okay? So, units of a brigade, let's see what we got here. Let's go with, let's go with this right here. So we got a five, a 10, and an eight, okay? All from the same brigade. So these two could stack together, that's 15 points, all right? Believe me, that's painful, but there is a case where that's not too bad. He could not stack here because that's 18, okay? Um, he could go over there and stack because that's 13. All right, so remember, 15 strength points from the same brigade, all right? Or any one single, so if one of these units was like a 20, which I, I don't think there are any, uh, because they started breaking down the counters into A's and B's later. But if he were like a 20, that rule means that he could be in that hex by himself. And you don't have to extend, okay? And we'll talk about that here shortly, too. All right. So 15 strength points per hex, a maximum, from any units of the same brigade. Or any one unit, regardless of a strength. Plus, if these, say these two were stacked here. There were 13, okay? Make sure I got this right, all right? Now oh, where'd I go, okay. Plus one battery or six guns from any number of batteries. So let's say that this battery had three units that totaled eight guns. That entire battery could be in that hex with them. Or you could have six guns total from any number. So you could have six different batteries, uh, sections from a battery and each has one gun but there's six of them, you could have them in there, all six of them, all right? So it's one complete battery or six guns from any number of batteries can be in that hex with as many as 15 infantry strength points. All right, mounted cavalry, all right? Mounted cavalry, when they're in advanced or attack, mounted cavalry can have seven. Seven total strength points in the hex, okay? Regardless, or, or one mounted unit regardless. So it's kind of like the infantry. The infantry can have... You know, if one regiment had 20 strength points, they could have the hex by themselves. Well, that for the cavalry is, uh, if a cavalry unit has seven strength points, and there are a few out there, um, and there's some that are even more, that seven could occupy the hex by himself. Or if he was a 10, he could occupy the hex by himself with no penalty. Um, but if it was a mixture of units, it can't be more than seven. So infantry's 15, plus one battery or six guns from any number of batteries. Cavalry mounted is seven strength points and then plus one battery or six guns from any number of batteries. So it's the same thing uh, with the infantry as far as artillery goes. It applies to the mounted cavalry uh, in advance or attack orders. So seven mounted strength points plus one battery or six guns from any number of batteries. You got to remember, look at these units when you get them, okay? And you'll see, especially the Confederates are a lot, have a lot of them. All right, let me get that down where you all can see that. All right, so that unit right there, 26 Indiana B, that means he's got a, probably another one that says an A. He might even have one that's a C. So he might have three sections. And the reason why they do this is because they have different gun types. So 26 Indiana A, B, and C would make up one battery. All right, some of the Confederate units, I think you have some that are two. So I think there's even a couple that have four in the Death Valley because they have so many different gun types. But just remember, if they're the same regiment, it might have an A, B, C, or D behind it. That's one battery, all of them together. All right. All right, artillery and advance or attack orders. If not stacked with infantry or cavalry, up to two artillery batteries per hex, regardless of their strength or 12 guns from any number of batteries. If stacked with infantry or cavalry, artillery is limited to one battery per hex or six guns from any number of batteries. <laughs> Didn't that just contradict? No, nope, that's all right, one battery. Okay, now I tell you where I find that handy is artillery that is stacked together that is firing at more than four hexes, they can combine their fire using the, die roll, the worst die roll modifier of all the gun types, all right? You don't, they're not cumulative. But, so, if you're trying to do a shoot, a bombard, no, not a special bombard, but if you're trying to use 
of stacks of cannons one at a time to knock guns out of a battery that's eight hexes away or uh, disrupt infantry. Because the, the artillery doesn't get any damage numbers. When they shoot, they get disruptions or disorders. They get little Ds or big Ds, maybe. So to be effective, you've got to disrupt and then hope that there's a second disruption coming from another unit firing at them. So getting a bunch of, getting 12 guns in a hex and shooting them all at the one time. And I had, uh, in Gettysburg, I had a, the Confederates uh, massing like that as best I could so that I could get gun strength on these hexes because you can't move them in there, you know, at point blank range voluntarily. So you'd have to wait for the enemy to come to you. Well, for the Confederates, that really doesn't happen on the first day unless, you know, some random Union regiment decides to charge a Confederate position that has guns in it. And I can't say that didn't happen because it did. And it did during the actual battle too, so. Okay, um, so that takes care of that. Units under advance orders that wish to make use of the movement costs for pikes, roads, and trails, you must use the march order stacking, which we just went over. Stacking is covered in two methods, in two orders, march orders or advance and attack, okay? All right, stacking and movement. During a movement phase, units must be moved one at a time. All right, so these two units are stacked together and you're gonna move, you gotta move one at a time and then come back and get those. Now remember, don't be a Weisenheimer thinking, oh, see, okay, I wanna move this guy underneath first to the front. Remember, he's gonna be passing through that regiment. You're gonna pay a penalty for that. So your best bet is to start with and then they, plus you got to, I think you got to roll There's certain circumstances where you got to roll to see if they don't get disrupted going through that unit because they got to scatter a little bit. Come on. 250 guys are going to try to open a gap for 350 guys. That, I doubt that, you know, <laughs> I doubt they just opened the gate and made a big enough hole for all those guys to pass through, especially when they're in line formation. Okay. So one unit at a time moves and then the other one moves. And remember, if he goes into that hex and stops, he's underneath. He's in the back. Uh, let's see. And a combat unit can move through another unit at a cost of two movement points in addition to the terrain. In addition, the moving unit takes a UDD. He takes a, you know one of those disordered die rolls, disruption die rolls, universal, whatever, immediately after exiting the stationary unit's hex. It adds to that roll the normal cost of entering the stationary unit's hex if that cost is two or greater. So thus moving through, okay, so if moving through here, so if he, this unit, oh boy, if this unit were to move through here, that's clear hex. So we know it costs one, all right? But he's got to add two movement points. So that's going to cost him three. So if he's here and he's in advance orders, he's going to go one, two, three, four, and then out the other side, five, okay? And he's still got one more room. The problem is once he moves out that other side, if this hex over here, I'm going to make sure because I think I don't want to make sure I boo-boo this. The normal cost for entering the stationary unit's hex, if that cost is two or greater, all right? So, Okay. Immediately after exiting the stationary unit's hex, it adds to that die roll the normal cost for entering the stationary unit's hex if that cost is two or greater. Okay, so that unit's in a clear hex and it's only one to get in there. He wouldn't have he would not have to add to his uh, universal die roll, disruption die roll, whatever. He would just normal roll with no no pluses to it. Um, if this guy were in the woods. Slide this over a little bit more. If he were in the woods and he moved through him and then came out the other side, all right, not only would he have to make his universal disruption die roll, his UDD, because this guy was in the woods and the woods terrain effect for movement is plus two, he would end up having to add that plus two to his, uh, his die roll to see if he gets disordered. All right. And... You, <laughs> That's one of those rules I, that sometimes I don't, I miss it. Um, I've gotten better at it as I've continued to play the series. I've gotten a lot better at it, but it is one of those rules that you can miss. So 
just remember that just go just go read go into eight eight uh, two and under eight two one and read that when you get ready to move through another unit you got to know that those are those are two lines getting ready to to cross through each other all right you got to know that's going to cause some disorganization so just go when you go to do that just go it's not that hard it's pretty simple 822 is the explanation on how to do it all right artillery infantry or cavalry units they may move through artillery units but not vice versa artillery cannot pass through infantry or cavalry units they can move into the hex with them under the stacking all right all right non-artillery units do not pay um two movement points to move through artillery, or they don't have to roll. They don't have to do a UDD, all right? All right, so you, all right, road movement. Units moving along pikes and roads, but not trails, may move through friendly units in such a hex, paying the movement cost for the pike or the road, unless the latter unit that was in the hex already is in march orders. So if these two units are on the road here, all right? Let me see it, move it over again. I'm doing some shift in here. I could just zoom the camera out, but I want you to see the counters. So let's say that this guy here is in March orders, and he is in March orders, all right? And you're moving him. I, now, granted, they, they would be moving in the same terms or from the same regard. Let's say these are two different complete divisions, and this, well, this one's moving. He cannot move through that unit using the road because this unit is on the road in March orders, okay? So in other words, you've got, you've got a unit in column, and you can't see you got a unit in a column in a straight line and then another unit is going to try to move up while they're in a column that's good hand work isn't it i need to work on my fingernails so they can't they can't pass through them in the column like that um it, what it's saying is is like if it was only a half movement point in march to move along that road they it would cost them more because they would have to go around that unit that's on the road in march orders that's sitting there and so they would have to use the other terrain to go you know simple they're just going to walk around them inside the same hex so they would end up using the cost of the clear terrain in there to go around them which is one all right yeah so it says right there um the moving unit must enter and exit the stationary units hex from a connected pipe or road in order to do that if the friendly units are under march orders, the moving unit pays the cost of the actual terrain in the hex, plus any hex side cost to enter it, unless it's moving around the unit that is blocking the road. All right. Uh, now, if this unit here is in this hex in advance orders, then they can just you, they can continue. This unit comes through in march orders; they can just go right on through them. Okay, using the using the road because that's a small gap that's going to be open. So keep that in mind. Unit cannot move through another unit using the road movement rates if the stationary unit in the hex is in march orders and a unit in march orders comes up, they've got to go around them. In the same hex, they just get off the road and walk around them. That's all it is. All right, uh, bridge or ford. If a unit is under march orders, occupies either side of a bridge or ford, a moving unit may not use that bridge or ford. I don't have any on that map, so if, let's say, this right here was a bridge or a ford, and this unit is sitting right here, and he is in, he is in march orders. That guy is in march orders. And this guy is coming down the road, and he's in, it doesn't matter what formation he's in, actually, I think. Let me make sure. Yeah. A moving unit cannot use, so it doesn't matter what formation this is in, this guy cannot move across that bridge of that ford right there because he is sitting there blocking. What it's trying to say is he's right up there on the edge of the bridge or maybe even on it, uh, and he's in march order, so he's got the bridge covered. There's no room for anybody to move through there. You know, if this, you know, granted, this situation, here has just a creek, this stream, they can just go over that. But if this were an uncrossable waterway and they have to use the bridge, everybody coming up here would be stopped behind him because they can't. He's, he's blocking that bridge or that ford. Trying to keep this simple, guys, and trying to get through it. Uh, let's see. Uh, any unit that may move or retreat into a hex with another unit within stacking restrictions and end its movement therein. 
If the movement, moving unit entered the stationary unit's hex through a frontal hex side, it is placed on top of the stack. If it entered through a flank or rear hex side, it is stacked beneath the non-moving unit. We've already been over that. You enter the hex with a frontal unit from behind, you go to the bottom. You enter it from the front, you go to the top. Okay? It's, that's pretty easy. Uh, let's see. Infantry or cavalry that is moving or voluntarily retreating into a hex that contains only artillery may freely choose to stack under or on top of the artillery. So that's, we also talked about that. If you move in, if you move an infantry regiment into a hex with cannons from behind, you can put the infantry unit on top or you can leave them underneath, doesn't matter. If a non-artillery unit is already stacked under the artillery and the moving unit enters the hex through one of the stationary stacks front hex sides, it may stack directly under or above the artillery. So what that's saying is, and I don't have the right numbers out here. Let's, uh, yeah, I do. All right, so we got this eight sitting right here. Make sure we're in the camera. Yeah, okay. I got that eight sitting right there. He's got an artillery battery sitting on top. And this guy is up here in front. And he retreats. And he retreats into that hex. He's fine. With the, he's in the stacking restrictions, we'll say. All right, well... Yeah, because it can be as many as 15. He has the choice of being on top of the artillery or going under the artillery. Okay? But he stays in front of that guy. Same works in reverse. If he comes in from back here, and that because that infantry unit's in there, he goes behind. He doesn't have a choice of getting in front of that artillery. It's only when he comes into it from the frontal hexes. Phasing unit may change its stacking order within a hex instead of moving, but only then. If under advance orders, a unit changing stacking order cannot fire. Stacking order may not be changed if the stack in the frontal hex of an enemy unit. All right, so get these out of the way. All right, so this this division got activated. All right, they haven't moved. They're in advance orders. They haven't moved. They haven't fired. They haven't, they haven't done anything. So they decide, oh, I need to switch. Let's get the five on top. So the two regiments switch positions in the line. They're done. Okay. End of story. Because it says during their turn. All right. Stacking order may not be changed if the stack is in the frontal hex. So if they're sitting here and this unit's right there in their frontal hex. And see, that's where you got to understand the key to this. We know that this is the front, all right? But those two hexes are the frontal, that's a frontal hex, that's a frontal hex. So if an enemy unit is in a frontal hex, this unit cannot change its uh, sequence there, okay? Can't be done. All right, units given march orders or under advance order and adopting march order stacking limits must start the phase stacked as long as they follow march stacking as they move. So units given march orders or under advance order and adopt marching order stacking limits, they may start the phase stacked as long as they follow march stacking as they move. So, all right, let's try to get an example of that. I don't know if I can. I don't think I have any small enough units here. Um... No, I don't. All right, well, let's just do an example here. Let's say that these two Confederate units, all right, they were both two strength units, all right? You could have, or say he was a three, so you got a four and a three. All right, so they're in the same hex. This unit gets orders to go into march mode, all right? Successfully, they go into march mode, okay? So since there's only seven strength points in there, they can move. See, they're in a stack, they can move, okay? Only situation where that happens. Let's see, when stacked, small arms and artillery units activate using different AMs. Yeah, so any facing change by one unit in the stack determines a new facing for the entire stack. Unless the facing unit moves, after the facing change. That's that, you know, 
you stay facing the same as the other unit, the top unit in the hex, but if he moves out, you can change your facing, okay? Um, all right, so I think we're going to stop this one right there, and we'll come back. We're going to do stacking in combat. All right, so we'll, this has already gone stretched long enough. Covering, so we've covered facing, uh, refusal, and we've covered stacking in the different environments of movement. And we're going to be getting the stacking in combat here before long. So we're going to start there at the end of rule 826. And with the next uh, one, we'll pick up 8.3, and that's stacking in combat. All right, guys, so I can do it.